Okay, uh, exactly three minutes past the hour. Welcome everybody to this Biodiversity Genomics Academy session on Earl Grey TE, and we have Toby who actually invented Earl Grey TE. So hand over the floor to you, Toby. Great, thank you. Um, it's nice to see so many people here and interested in TE annotation. Um, it's nice to know it's not just me. Um, so hopefully all of you have managed to get the Git pod up and running. If we've got a little thumbs up, if people have managed to do that. Um, and then I can get on to sharing. And I'm hoping that everyone can see that as well. Perfect. Um, great. Yeah. So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this BGA session where I'll be introducing you to annotating TEs with Earl Grey. Um, so as Susha already gave the instruction, I'm Toby and uh, I spent a considerable amount of time and pain writing Earl Grey. Um, so I thought basically if you've got any questions as we go through, the best thing to do would be to write them in the Discord. Um, and I'll basically try to address them as we go through, which is try and create a little bit of a dialogue um, so you don't just have to sit and listen to me go on about how much I love to use for 45 minutes. Um, and so before we kind of get into the details of Earl Grey, we might as well get it running on Gitpod. So this might be slightly different to some of the other sessions you've been to um, in that because I've tried to make it user friendly, you only have to write one thing and press one button. Um, and then essentially after that, we'll just go through and I'll talk about how it works and uh, what's going on. And with enough time at the end that we can explore some of the results and chat about um, some of the other stuff that the pipeline can do. Um, so as hopefully you can see on your Git pod, when you open it, all the dependencies are installed, the Conda environment is active and everything smoothly just works. Um, for the demonstration, hopefully if you can see it, um, but I'll wait a little bit so people can have a little bit of time to catch up. You should see a FASTA file in the workspace directory. Um, and this contains chromosome one of the genome assembly of the monarch butterfly. And this has been specifically selected to give you enough time uh, to have an introduction to Earl Grey, but without taking days, hours to run. Um, as the runtime generally of most TE annotation pipelines is really heavily dependent on both repeat content and genome size. Um, so hopefully people have managed to get the Git pod running. Should we, uh, can we get a thumbs up on the Discord uh, or a thumbs down if you haven't got it running? So mine is still hanging which hasn't happened before. So maybe maybe too many of us are doing too many things, which is, um, give me a second. Mine is saying loading pre-build and it just does take a little time the first time because this is, um, there's a lot of data being loaded in the pre-build. Oh, but lots of thumbs ups, excellent. Yeah, this is good. I mean, there's a lot of background stuff being loaded. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty chunky pipeline. <laughs> what you should see is, uh, do you want to show them a screen of what you're seeing or not yet? On Gitpod? Yeah, just uh, it should sh it should show up with like the little Earl Grey prompt. Yes, yeah, so you should have like Earl Grey in brackets and then you should be in the slash workspace directory. I think you should go ahead because uh, most people have got it and mine cool. hasn't got it either. So I will be catching up along with a couple. Yeah, of yeah, there's, there's plenty of time anyway. Um, so essentially what we have is the genome that we're going to be annotating, which is the one that you should be able to see if you can still see the my PowerPoint as well. So it's nc underscore um, Um, And essentially to get Earl Grey running, we only need a very simple command. So there's only three flags that are always required for an Earl Grey run. Um, and the first is the full path to the genome with the G flag. If now I have too many windows open, there we go. Um, so we need to give it the full path to our FASTA file, which in this case is going to be slash workspace slash name of the FASTA file. Then we can have the S flag. So this is basically used to name the output directory in all of the files. So you can make this anything that you want to. 
as long as it doesn't have any spaces or unusual characters. So in my case, I've just called it Monarch Demo, but I mean, feel free to go crazy or name it anything that's useful for you. Uh, we then have the O flag, which is going to tell Earl Grey where to save all our analysis and outputs. So this must be a directory that already exists. Um, and then within that directory, Earl Grey will make its own output directory um, that it will store all its stuff in. Um, and it also accepts relative file paths, so you can use like dot slash um, to go from wherever you currently are in your system. Um, and nothing gets deleted in Earl Grey, so you'll be able to go in and explore all of these kind of intermediate files as we go through, so you can kind of get an idea what it's doing. And then the final one, we ask you to load the large workspace so that we can use the T flag. Um, so this tells Earl Grey how many threads are available for it to use. So in this case, we're using a large machine. We've got eight cores. Let's not sit here for three days. You don't listen to me for that long. Um, so we might as well use all of them. Um, and essentially, you just type this all out in a line, press enter, and it should start running with nice little pictures of cups of tea. And so if you've got that, Oh yeah, Dorothy, you have a question? Um, why do you need the species name to specify in the um in the command line? Oh, so so that can be anything you want, just so you know what like so okay. it, just to name the files and things so you know what you're looking at when it's finished. Okay, but it's compulsory, okay. Yeah. Because I work on species that are not accepted yet in the uh, nomenclature of plants, which are which is very complex, so it won't give me an error or anything. No, no, it's it's just to name the file, so it can be absolutely anything you want. Okay, thanks a lot. Cool, and then hopefully if that's running, um, I'm just going to go through a little bit of an introduction and then uh, go through the pipeline step by step. So again, feel free to jump in with any questions at any point. Um, it might make more sense to kind of answer questions as you have them. Um, so yeah, make use of the Discord for that. And so the main question I get a lot is, why have you made another TE annotation pipeline? Or why do we keep focusing on the development of tools? And the answer, the simple answer is that basically TE annotation is really complicated. And the reality is that we still don't really know enough about the nature and diversity of TEs to automatically identify and classify them well. Um, if we combine this with the fact that there's quite a lot of complications in their biology and the dynamics of how they interact with their host genomes, it's really, really difficult to accurately identify TEs, particularly if they're degraded or turned over. And so as you can imagine, several attempts have been made to improve TE annotation, actually more than several, um, there's over 115 tools for you to choose from. Um, and essentially, these fall into three main categories. So first, you have your library-based methods. Uh, so these will be the ones you might be most familiar with. Um, so essentially, these try and identify and classify transposable elements based on the similarity to a library of consensus sequences. So the main example that most of you might have come across is using repeat masker with either DFAM or RepBase to identify TEs in an input genome. Then you've got your de novo pipelines. Um, so again, you might be quite familiar with some of these. So these attempt to identify TEs uh, within an input genome, usually through something uh, like a process that will look for the same sequence repeated several times. Um, so things like repeat model repet will just look for repetitive bits of DNA. And then often these they'll try to classify these based on similarity to known elements. And finally, a little bit rarer, but we have these structure-based pipelines. And so these aim to identify TEs through the presence of particular domains, and then also the distances between these domains. Um, so for example, you might identify an LTR retrotransposon through the presence of LTRs at either end, and then internal domains and the distance between these different bits. Um, and often we find that TE annotation tools have been developed for particular studies or to fulfill specific aims. So loads of these tools are actually extremely specialized. And that often means they're not particularly user friendly. Uh, they're often quite difficult to install outside of a system that they've been developed in. Uh, and actually many of them are not maintained beyond the end of a specific project. So we often have tools that are basically impossible to install now because the dependencies are missing or databases disappear or links die. Um, and so it's a bit of a minefield to be honest. And then on top of this, we actually have the, the, the requirements of the community for TE annotation are quite variable. So we often get quite large differences in the quality of the annotations that people get depending on what their overall aim is. 
So for example, if you want to mask TEs before you annotate genes in a genome, you might just be quite happy to run a repeat masker run as quick and easily as you can with a library that exists for something that's relatively close to the species you look at. But someone who is more interested in like T dynamics or host interactions might actually require a de novo library and then likely some level of manual curation and annotation to make sure that the annotations are exactly what they're looking for. And so there are several challenges facing the TE community at the present, and a lot of us are working to address these. And I think it's just important to keep these in the back of your mind whenever you're doing some TE annotation. And so the first one is obviously the most common TE annotation tool is Repeat Masker, but it was actually initially designed to mask TEs to improve subsequent gene annotation. And it does a really good job of this, but perhaps this doesn't make it the best approach to adapt or to use if we're specifically look interested in the TEs rather than removing them, at least not when it's used on its own. And so something I'm sure we're all aware of in science, we don't like paywalls and we don't like paying for things that we shouldn't have to pay for. Um, so many of you will be aware that RepBase uh, is now behind a paywall. And this was probably the best and most used TE consensus database um, before it went behind a paywall. Um, but you know, this has just made it unviable for many institutions and researchers to use. A license is thousands of dollars a year. Um, there's quite strict usage requirements on each license. So essentially, a large uh, portion of researchers are basically just shut out because they can't afford to pay for it. Overcoming this is DFAM. Uh, so this has been growing rapidly with a lot of researchers choosing to deposit their new TE sequences here. Um, I really like DFAM. It's a great resource. However, I would really like to highlight some of the challenges of this, just so again, we can see the standard of what we're working with. So in, the, in version 3.7, which I think is still the latest, um, there are over or just under three and a half million consensus sequences in this library. So you'd think you have a lot of data to work with to help you. However, of these, only 19,730 of them are curated. So, so, so nearly the whole database is made up of uncurated sequences that have been found by de novo tools and then just uploaded. So this could mean that some of the classifications are a bit dubious, some of them are wrong, some of them could be derived from sequences that are not TEs. Um, so for example, just from a quick search, we found that actually a lot of um, programs will pick up, particularly in like snake genomes, they'll annotate venom genes as TEs because they're just found in multi-copy. Um, so you can often end up with quite a few multi-copy genes in these libraries if you're not kind of weeding them out specifically. Um, the main issue we have here is just the pace of the release of genomic data far outstrips the resources we have for curation. Um, and most generally, most people are not overly concerned with the T library being the most amazing quality in the world. Again, if you're just interested in annotating your genes in your genome, you just want to get rid of them. Um, so essentially, we have lots of sequences which we have no confirmation of what they really are. And so if you want to use these databases, I would highly recommend using the curated section of DFAM or being very skeptical of the classifications you get if you decide to use the full one. Um, in addition, de novo tools often struggle to classify TE families to family level. So we have a lot of sequences being classified as unknown or unclassified, or you know, we can't really tell you what this is, but we think it's something. Um, and this is partly down to what I mentioned with our knowledge of diversity still lacking. Um, but I personally see this becoming less of an issue in the future as we just sample more and more stuff at higher and higher quality. Um, but this is particularly reliant on people taking up that mantle to curate and accurate, uh, accurately classify the things that they find. And then finally, TE annotations often struggle with fragmentation. And so given the biology of TEs and the way that they interact with their host genomes, um, TEs often degrade, leave specific domains or regions behind, whilst other regions become unrecognizable. So things like purifying selection, working on particular parts of TEs, whereas other bits kind of degrade through drift, um, whilst other bits might actually be under positive selection. Um, and so the challenge here is this can inflate TE count where a single insertion is labeled as multiple different ones because you get like multiple domains with bits in between that don't look like a TE. So we get lots of little fragments. And so I thought I'd highlight these because these are kind of some of the main challenges that I was trying to address with developing this tool. And so now we actually get into the detail. So what exactly did we set out to do with this pipeline? So we wanted to create 
a pipeline that was user friendly to install and run. You don't need to have a computer engineering degree. You don't need to understand how a server works. You don't need to have strange databases and weird permissions where you have to let these tools kind of do weird things to your computer. Um, there's also uh, multiple solutions for installation. So for the majority of users, you should be able to install this through one method or another. Um, obviously, you know, depending on some servers, it's a little bit more difficult than other servers, but in general, I've tried to make it as easy as possible. And that's why, you know, this Git, this Git pod is amazing because you've all just written one line of code and got it running. Brilliant. If that works for you, great. If you want it installed on another server, there's other methods to do that. Um, we want to facilitate automated TE annotation whilst trying to address the challenges that I've just mentioned. And so I'm not trying, I really want to make it clear, I'm not trying to replace manual curation, but I'm trying to close the gap because many people don't have the time or the resources for manual curation and their projects don't necessarily require that. Um, but hopefully by improving automated curation, Earl Grey should be able to facilitate the aims of your study and also help to reduce the amount of rubbish being uploaded to public databases. So hopefully it will just help to improve our understanding of TEs in the long run. Um, the next thing is we don't really want to rely on premium databases. You know, not everyone can afford thousands of dollars a year to access a database. Um, so I really wanted to try and make sure that this is open source. Anyone can use it. Anyone can access the databases that it uses. So there's no hurdles to using this tool. So hopefully, you know, even if you've got a simple laptop that can run Linux, you should be able to use this. Um, and finally, we want it to run relatively fast and without interference. You don't want to be messing with intermediate files. You don't want to be faffing about with getting multiple scripts to run. You press one button, it runs start to finish, and it tries to do it relatively quickly. I say relatively quickly because TE annotation is extremely computationally demanding. So the more computing power you can give it, the faster it will be, but to a point, um, how large your genome is and how much of it is repetitive will be the main deciding factor on how long it takes to run. And often it can take multiple days, particularly if your genome is a few gigabases in size. So now we get to the point of why you're all here. Um, how does Earl Grey work and what does it do? So here is just a basic overview of the pipeline and it's split into several stages which are performed sequentially. Um, each step relies on the output of the previous one. So in total, there's roughly 15 independent stages that form the whole pipeline. And we'll go through these step by step so that hopefully by the end, you understand the pipeline enough to be confident um, to understand like why we've done certain things and what impact this has on the consensus sequences you get at the end. You will also notice that so everything in pink is an optional step. So I will still go through and describe these um, as well as give you some situations and think that I think they'll be most useful. But for the demonstration today, we're only running the core pipeline, so all of the default steps. Um, obviously, feel free to play around with it more later on if you want to see what effect uh, using some of these options has, and you can go through and compare the sort of different things that come up. Um, and if you want to follow along, at the bottom of each slide, I've put the path to the directory that each step relates to, so you can go and dig deeper into the intermediate steps and look at all the files that are generated and try and get a feel for the sort of data we're dealing with. Um, and so with that, we'll go through to our first stage. So in the first step, um, I'm hoping this will save a headache for a lot of people because I know at least for me, I spend 90% of my time formatting files and getting rid of horrible things that people have put in their GFF files, et cetera. Um, Earl Grey will prepare the input faster to ensure compatibility with all downstream tools in the pipeline. So the first thing we do is we take your original assembly file and compress it. Uh, and it will have the nomenclature seen here. So it will just be a dot back dot GZ. So in the event that Earl Grey does something horrible to your genome assembly, you still have a version of it safe. Um, following this, we take all faster headers in the file that we're going to modify, and we change them for a generic header, which is going to be consist of the letter CTG and then underscore and then a number. So the first will be CTG1, the second CTG2, and so on. And essentially what we do this for is that a lot of the pipelines and the tools that we're using actually have a limit on how long a faster header can be. But if you've ever downloaded something from NCBI, sometimes there's tons of metadata in this header um, and it's just too long and the, the pipelines crash. 
So we replace them with this generic headers, but we also make a dictionary so that we can backtrace uh, faster headers and actually Earl Grey will automatically do this at the end for you. And finally, we replace all of our ambiguous codes with uh, the letter N. Uh, some of the search engines used in Repeat Masker actually can't cope with these ambiguous codes. Um, and it also makes sure that we're totally compatible with all our tools downstream in the pipeline. And then, so what we end up with is a version of the genome that has dot prep written at the end. Um, and this is the one that essentially is gonna be run through the pipeline and that we're gonna use for everything. And so following our preparation of the input genome, if we specify this, we can annotate repeats that we already understand and know about. Um, so this is done using repeat masker. So it will be a process you should be quite familiar with. So the sequences used to mask known repeats depend on whether we provide a custom library. So you might have a faster file from a, a genome that you've already annotated before, um, or which species we give um, repeat masker with the R flag in the L grade command. So for example, in this case, we've got the monarch genome. I could have used the R flag and just put Lepidoptera, and then it would have taken all of the Lepidoptera sequences from whichever database repeat masker is, curate, is um, configured with. Or I could have had an existing library that I had from a few years ago or something, and I could specify that with the L flag. Um, in both cases, you can just basically choose. Um, if you're not sure whether you should use an existing library or not, I would ignore this step. But here's a couple of use cases where I think it could be useful. So firstly, if you have a very closely related species that has a very good pre-existing library, you might use this to mask known repeats just to speed up the next step. Alternatively, uh, if you have, for example, 20 different genome assemblies for the same species or very closely related ones, you could use El Grey in a serial approach. So this is something I'd highly recommend if you're doing like large comparative studies. So you annotate the first genome de novo, then you take the library from that first one and you use it to pre-mask the next one. And then you use the combined library from that one to mask the third one and so on. So step by step, you're creating like a big combined library from each individual. Somewhere I would highly not recommend using this step is when you want an annotation done quickly and you think a library exists for a species that's kind of related, but kind of not related. Um, because we know that TE content can vary significantly even within a single genus. And so actually by pre-masking with sequences from a distant species, we can actually reduce the information that's given to Earl Grey in the de novo stage. So we can end up overestimating TE age and divergence, and we can actually get a poorer quality TE library. So if in doubt, ignore this step and don't worry about it. Now we get to the real starting point of Earl Grey. So this is probably what's still running on your Gitpod uh, session at the moment, um, which is to start with our de novo TE identification run. So here we're going to use repeat modeler two, which performs an all by all genome alignment to identify repetitive sequences. And then these are refined through multiple rounds. This is the rate limiting step. It's very computationally intensive. The more compute power you can give it, the better. Um, to some point, it just takes ages to run. Um, so also here we have repeat modeler with a classifier module. So it will attempt to classify anything that it finds based on the similarity to existing TEs. And this maybe slightly unintuitively depends on which database your repeat masker install is set up with. Um, so if you use a rep base or DFAM or both, um, and then it will also look to see whether TE derived proteins are present in these um, sequences or not. So the input here depends on whether the initial masking step in step two was run or not, but essentially it's either the prepared genome, which it is in our case for our workshop, um, or it's a hard masked version where known TEs are basically hidden from repeat modeler. And here repeat modeler will output a TE consensus library, and this contains all your identified repetitive sequences. Most, I hope, should be real TEs. Uh, but some potentially at this point could be multi-copy host genes, random non-TE derived repetitive regions, things like that. Um, and each consensus sequence will have a name following the repeat modeler convention. So you have your round number, uh, family number, hashtag, and then what repeat modeler thinks it is. Um, so if any of you have done this before, you know, you've probably run this. This is the, usually the starting point for manual curation or for where you might start trying to refine your TEs. But often people will just run this and then use it to mask a genome and go, cool, job done. 
And so a really important thing to note is that we had to add an automatic fail safe for repeat modeler two to run successfully. So the reason for this is that repeat modeler two will fail on some genome assemblies based on the way that it samples um, the sequence that you give it. So it, 99% of the runs on Drosophila melanogaster will fail because of the way that the nucleotides are sampled. So there will be enough unsampled nucleotides to trigger a new round of repeat modeler, but there's not enough nucleotides for that round to complete. So the program just fails and you end up with no libraries. To overcome this, uh, Earl Grey will check that the results are present and that they look okay. And if not, it will automatically rerun repeat modeler two, but set a limit on the number of sampling stages. And then it will, again, verify that things are there. And if not, it will then drop the number of stages again. So without you having to do anything, it will automatically just rerun stuff if it doesn't run properly. And it will change the parameters specifically to make sure that we try and get something that will succeed. Um, it's very rare that this happens. Um, so it's very unlikely that any of you will ever experience a failure at this step. Um, it's just a weird nuance of the size of sampling um, that repeat modeler uses. And a question from Sujai. Um, so, yeah, so basically you have sampling stages in repeat modeler. So repeat modeler will not actually take a whole genome. It will basically start with about 40 megabases in the first round, look for repetitive sequence in that, and then it will add more bases for the second round and gradually increase the amount of um, megabases that it uses. The maximum that repeat modeler will analyze is about 240 megabases. Um, so essentially, if your genome is 240 megabases, you will have sampled the whole thing. If it's bigger than that, every time you run a repeat modeler, it will probably run a different sample of, of that. Uh, it will always run 240, but it will run different parts of the genome, most likely. Um, so essentially, what we're doing is just making sure that the stage is complete properly, the sampling has worked. Um, hopefully that makes sense for the next question down as well, but let me know if it doesn't. Uh, and then Terry, is repeat modeler run with the LTR flag? Specifically, no, because we run a separate LTR analysis later in the pipeline. Uh, and also this is kind of partly because we wrote this before they added the LTR step. Um, and they've added it later. Um, and also just that we wanted to run like a full structural one. Um, Pauline, good question. I will answer that later if that's okay. Um, can the results of previous repeat mask repeat modeler runs be used? Yes, Diego. So you can put them into stage two. So you can use your previous repeat mask repeat modeler results as your to mask your known repeats. Um, and then it will just use exactly what you give it. So hopefully we're up to date at that point for the moment. Following this, this is where the bulk of our effort into uh, repeat, well, into Earl Grey went. So uh, we basically start the process to try and improve on this core set that are generated by Repeat Modeler 2. So essentially what we've tried to do is automate the manual curation process as much as we can using automated methods. So the main benefit you're gonna get here is that every TE consensus from every species that you analyze is treated the same way. So we're trying to go some way towards improving the reproducibility of results, um, which is almost impossible with manual curation because there's just the inherent variability of humans looking at patterns. Different people will see different things if they've got different amounts of experience, things like that. Um, and so the consensus sequences are improved using a beat process, so blast, extend, align, trim. And don't worry, I'll go through each step in a second. And this was first uh, kind of widely described by Neil Platt uh, from David Ray's lab in about 2016. Um, and we implement this process in Earl Grey through a module called T-Strainer, um, which you will be able to see in the Git, in the Git pod uh, in the Earl Grey folder. Um, so this is an iterative program. So essentially what we do is we try and refine a consensus sequence. Anything that needs improving again, we rerun through the pipeline over and over again until we get to a point where no more improvements can be made. And the T-strainer module is split into several steps that I'm about to go through. Um, but overall, the aim is to remove things that are probably not TE derived, like satellites, tandem repeats, 
um, to improve our consensus sequences by making them longer um, without including these non-TE sequences. And then we want to try and reclassify these extended sequences to make sure that we're classifying things correctly. And so the first uh, step of this beat process involves finding the copies of each TE consensus family in the input genome. And so to do this, uh, copies of each TE consensus sequence are identified using DC Megablast. So this is a blast end search that's modified to look for relatively discontiguous sequences. And this is important because TEs can actually be quite degraded from the original consensus. Um, and we want to make sure that we're trying to pick up as many copies as we can. Um, so essentially, we have our consensus sequence and we get all these other copies that come in that are like cover different parts of it. And to make a, the best consensus sequence that we can, we want to select the best copies uh, of from the genome to then refine our consensus with. So we only keep things if they have more than or equal to 70% pairwise identity with the consensus sequence and that they have at least 50% coverage of the consensus sequence. And then following that filter, we take the top 20 copies um, based on bit score. And these are the candidates which we then use to improve our consensus sequence, because there's no point trying to improve a consensus sequence with a really highly fragmented copy of a TE, because it won't look enough like the consensus to improve it. And so once we have our copies, uh, we extract them with a thousand base pairs added to each end. So this is the extend step, basically. And then we take these extended sequences and we generate a multiple alignment using MAFT, just with the auto settings. Um, and the result of this is essentially a sequence alignment of our extended sequences so that we can see if there's any sequence similarity that goes beyond the boundaries of the original consensus. So essentially, is there any extra bit of TE potentially present that was missed by repeat modeler? And so once we have this multiple alignment, we move on to our trimming step. And so each column in the multiple alignment is red and any columns that have a single base pair are removed. So if there's 19 copies that there's a gap and there's one copy that has one base pair in it we just bin that column because it's it's potentially some kind of small indel or something that's you know only found in one insertion we then check that all sequences align to the starting consensus with at least 50 percent coverage and so this is quite important um because if we end up with a very gappy sequence in the alignment which shouldn't happen because of the filtering quality step but it does still happen um we basically don't want to incorporate a very poor quality sequence into our consensus extension. So, for example, in this image, um, the orange sequence should be removed because whilst it does align to the consensus, it has huge gaps um, and it's not going to provide us with any high quality information to improve our consensus sequences. And then following this, we generate a new uh, multiple sequence alignment without the initial consensus sequence in it. Uh, and then from this, we generate a majority rule consensus sequence. And then we generate a new, with our new consensus sequence, we align it to our starting consensus sequence to make sure that it still represents the original. And um, this is actually really important because when we've done a lot of this kind of blast extract extend, if you get a lot of similarity on one end of a consensus sequence, you can actually start to shift the consensus sequence towards a five prime or a three prime. And after a few rounds of this, you can actually end up with something that doesn't look like the original consensus sequence at all. Um, and at this point, we then assess um, the result of this and there's multiple outcomes. So if the new consensus sequence is shorter than the original, or it has less than 80% coverage compared to the original consensus, then the new consensus sequence is determined to actually be of worse quality than the original. So we keep the original consensus as our final one. If the new consensus is longer than the original, but by less than 50% of the flank extension size, so in this case, we're running with default, so that's gonna be 500 base pairs, then the new consensus is improved and we determine that it's likely complete so it won't proceed to the next round. Because essentially what we've done is we've added 2,000 base pairs and it's only improved by 500. So we're saying, well, by adding another 2,000, it's very unlikely we're actually going to improve on that. If the new consensus, however, is longer than the original by at more than 50%, so if it's more than 500 base pairs longer than the original, 
then we'll say that we've improved this consensus, but there's a potential that we can further improve this. And so it will proceed through to another round of curation. Um, and essentially, we just continue through the blast ex extender line trim until no more sequences pass the threshold of being good, but needing more improvement or when the num maximum number of rounds is reached. Um, at the moment, the default maximum number of rounds is 10. In our experience, I have not yet seen one TE sequence get to 10 rounds, um, because essentially what this means is we've added 20,000 base pairs to the initial consensus sequence, which means that we're either in the middle of some huge repetitive region, or we're looking at something that's longer than any known, well, most known TEs. And so now what we have is we essentially have longer consensus sequences and now we need to do something with them so the next thing we do is we analyze the consensus library to prevent satellites and tandem repeats being contained in this library so because of their repetitive nature these can actually be extended through several rounds and we can get super super long um, consensus sequences and so essentially we have three different tools that are used to identify satellites and tandem repeats. So we use MREPS, SASSR and tandem repeat finder. Um, and, we, and we basically identify satellites. So following this, if a consensus sequence is at least 50% tandem repeat, we say that it's a satellite or a simple repeat. And if, it, if a single satellite unit is over 200 base pairs, it's a macro satellite. We take one copy and we save it as a satellite sequence. And sometimes what we'll also get is non-tandem repeat sequences that have multiple copies of a simple repeat at either end or one end. So a classic example is a line that can often have a, a, a satellite tail. And in these, um, in these instances, what we'll do is we'll trim the consensus so that there's one copy of the satellite found on the end of the consensus sequence, but then we trim the other copies. And so at this point, I'll just go to a couple of questions. Um, so can we give you an idea about the length of T's in general? It depends on different T superfamilies. So I think in general, LTRs are the longest usually, or Maverick, the Kryptons are also very long. Um, lines, roughly, I mean, so it, it even depends on the family, right? But I mean, lines, you'll probably get roughly up to about 6,000 base pairs off the top of my head. Um, Signs can be about 500 base pairs. Mites can be 250, 300 base pairs, up to about 500. Um, but in general, like if we're adding 20,000 base pairs to a consensus sequence, that that is just a lot because the consensus sequence itself should be of a certain length. Um, so, you know, even if we're starting with 20,000, like if we're starting with 1,000 base pairs to be 21,000 long, like repeat modelers should have found that and we shouldn't have to add that much stuff to the end of it. Um, so yes, different superfamilies have different lengths. The main challenge is we're trying to apply a mathematical rule to that. Um, so we just have to have some kind of cutoff. But the idea is that the sequence will no longer be improved anymore if we get to a point where there's single copy DNA present. So as soon as the homology drops off, those bits are cut off and then we don't extend it anymore. So once we have our extended consensus sequences, we've removed satellites, we've trimmed our satellites. Um, the next thing we want to do is reclassify them. So this is, we basically use repeat classifier, which is the same module that repeat modeler two uses. And essentially what it does is it looks for homology to known TE protein domains and also known TEs. But again, remember this is dependent on what database you've configured repeat masker with. So be very careful if you're using the uncurated version because you'll end up labeling things based on similarity to something that we also don't know what the true identity is. Um, and the aim here is to try and reduce the number of unknown elements as longer consensus sequences should provide more information for a peak classifier to work with. Wow. So if we've added a hundred base, well, if we've added a thousand base pairs to the end, we might have revealed um another domain or something useful that then repeat classifier can then find more more similarity to and it goes great i now know what this is and essentially then from this our repeat library is constructed um, and again i'll go back to a question from sam so our initial blast is 70 percent pairwise identity with 50 percent query coverage yes but the final verification is 80 percent of original so this seems different from the 80 80 80 rule so 
the 80 80 80 rule we use just to identify te families so when we're just trying to identify which copies match it's slightly different um so the idea with the 70 percent pairwise identity is we want to pick the best most representative slash longest or most recently active copies to make a consensus from um if we're doing less than 70% identity, it's probably quite a degraded copy, so it won't help us add any more information. The same thing with the query coverage. So if we have anything less than 50% coverage, it's probably a fragment. So if it's like a line, it's probably like a five prime end um, and things like that. The final verification of the 80% is actually not to do with defining a family, which is what we use the 8080 rule. It's actually seeing is, is the new consensus still representative of the original one? So if the new consensus sequence covers less than 80% of the original, it might be that it shifted towards a five prime end or it shifted towards a three prime end. And we might start to generate a consensus of something that looks totally different. So it's not necessarily the same thing as the 80 80 80 rule which will actually come up on my next slide so it's actually a really good time to ask that question so now we have our classified consensus sequences we have an optional step uh, where we can cluster our sequences to the 80 80 80 definition um, many of you might find this desirable to reduce redundancy in your te library however I would highly recommend, particularly after uh, discussing this with reviewers, um, not using this step or exercising extreme caution when you do, because this step can actually have quite unintended consequences and we can end up combining sequences with different evolutionary trajectories. So for example, imagine you have a sign element and a member of this sign family at some point in its evolutionary history has inserted into a DNA element. So in a different superfamily, it's inserted into it. And we've generated a chimeric sign DNA TE. And this has maintained a transposition activity. So this now chimeric repeat will transpose as a single unit. And it might have different insertion or activity dynamics, potentially different evolutionary forces acting upon it. But what you've also got is the original sign and the original DNA TE also transposing. So we have a chimeric repeat transposing and the separate ones transposing. If we decide to cluster the consensus sequences, because the sign will align very well to the sign part of the chimeric repeat, and conversely, the DNA element part will align very well to the DNA part, we'll end up with a consensus sequence for the chimeric repeat in our library, but not for the individual repeats that existed prior to this chimeric repeat. And so what can actually happen is we can identify every individual sign as being much older and more degraded than it actually is because it's being identified by using a chima that it was never actually part of. So unless you're totally sure that clustering is exactly what you want, I wouldn't necessarily recommend clustering or I would recommend going through the CD here output and weeding out these instances where it looks like two very short things might have been clustered with something that's a lot longer, because that's potentially a sign of a chimeric repeat that you might want to just keep separate in your library at the same time. Hopefully that makes sense because it's a little bit abstract um, to understand that point. Um, and prior to this, the, the discussions I had with reviewers, this was actually a default step in uh, Earl Grey, and they actually requested that we take it out and turn it into an option specifically for these uh, kind of instances. And so once we've potentially reduced redundancy, if we wanted to, um, if you've used an initial repeat masker step, uh, we will combine the library that was used in that initial step with our de novo one to generate a combined library that's going to be used for our final annotation. Um, if we haven't used a repeat masker step, Earl Grey will just store the de novo library in the correct location so that we can use it and you can find it again. So the next step that hopefully your pipeline will perform is the annotation of the input genome. So TEs in the original input genome are identified and masked using our now improved TE consensus library. And so we perform a sensitive search, which again is a little bit slower, but much more accurate. Um, and at the end of this step, you will have a TE annotation. And many of you will go, yes, this is a good stopping point. I can use this information. However, Many of these annotations will still be fragmented 
um, and others might be missing for larger or more complex elements. So particularly things like LTRs, which are really difficult to identify full length ones and things like that. So this is where our obsession with improving our TE annotations continues. The next step, which is why we didn't run it as part of repeat modeler, is to detect full length LTR elements. And the aim here is to aid the defragmentation step. And so this is done using a parallel implementation of LTR Finder, if any of you are familiar with this particular tool. And essentially what we're doing is we're looking for structural features of LTRs and stitching these together to form our full length LTR annotations. So we might find two LTRs, one each end, and then between these, we might find some of the internal domains, and then we go, okay, this is likely one potential full length LTR element. Then we get to the defragmentation step. And this is a beautiful tool that I'm hoping some of you might have come across um, called repeat craft. Um, and so the point of defragmentation is that we need to make sure that the small fragments of some TEs, potentially they could have come from one initial insertion. And so these small fragments actually make estimating the age of the TE insertion really difficult because it will look really old because it's small, it might have less uh, homology to the consensus sequence. And so we might completely underestimate the age or overestimate the age. And so to defragment our annotations, we use the loose merge mode of repeat craft. And essentially what this pipeline does is to determine whether fragments of annotated TEs are likely to have come from the same original insertion followed by degradation um, or whether they come from different insertions. So overall, basically like on, on a really simple level and I'll go through it in detail in a second, if an annotation is next door to each other, they don't overlap in the consensus that they match. They're in the same orientation and they're from the same DE consensus. They're stitched together and treated as an initial insertion. They've come from the same thing, bits have degraded. In a bit more detail, in this diagram, we can see that the leftmost block overlaps with the one next to it on the consensus. So the leftmost block actually comes from a, a, a bit that's like slightly further to the right than the bit to the left. And so these two parts are not merged because this leftmost block or the rightmost one could have come from a duplication, a tandem insertion event, or a separate TE insertion event. Because they're overlapping, it doesn't make sense for those bits to be found in the order that they are. The yellow box in this diagram indicates a simple repeat. And you can see that there's a block either side of this simple repeat that match the consensus. These two parts don't overlap and there's a distance between them. And so these two central blocks are merged, but we've retained the simple repeat annotation part um, because it could have been part of the TE. So many TEs might have small simple repeat regions, but it also could have arisen later through degradation or some kind of process downstream. And then finally, the rightmost block is also not merged because it's too far away from the others. So I've indicated that by a dotted line just for to make it look a little bit clearer. But this is also where our full length LTR annotation comes in. So what repeat craft will do is take the LTR annotation from repeat masker and then compare these to the predictions for full length LTRs from LTR finder. And so we have these three yellow blocks that repeat masker has identified they overlap with a full length LTR predicted by LTR finder. So we get, okay, this was an initially one LTR insertion. We'll call it one LTR insertion. The end result of this is an annotation file that has um, multiple parts stitched together. So we have what we think is the whole TE kind of stuck together in one lot. And then we can go on and go, okay, this was one insertion. How degraded is it? And things like that. Now we get to our final filtering and we're nearly at the point where we can explore some results. Um, so at this point, we've refined our TE consensus library. We've used it to annotate the input genome. And then we followed this by refining our annotations with the defragmentation process. Now, if any of you have looked into repeat masker results in detail, some of you I hope may have noticed that some of our TE annotations can sometimes overlap. And so, this happens when repeat masker doesn't know which TE annotation is correct at those base pairs. So you might have two TE annotations that overlap that have very similar scores. And repeat masker will just say, look, I can't tell you which one is right. So I'm going to put both of them in. Um, hopefully, as you're all aware and agree with me, it is impossible for a single base pair to be belong to two different TEs. Um, and this could actually be quite confounding for some of our downstream analyses. And so 
we have to make a decision. And in this case, it's quite an arbitrary decision, I will admit, um, because it's extremely difficult to accurately determine which base belongs to which TE. So instead of overcounting and inflating our counts, what we do is we take the overlapping section and we cut it in half. And so we say 50% give, gets given to the blue TE, 50% given to the yellow. There is a potential, this isn't necessarily biologically meaningful. However, neither is an overlapping base pair being counted twice. Um, so this just makes sure that our downstream quantification makes sense, prevents us overestimating our TE content in the input genome. Um, and honestly, if there ever becomes a better way where I can understand exactly which base pair comes from which TE, I will definitely update this to, to make sure that we're doing things the right way. Um, and then finally, before our final quantification, we remove any TE annotation that is less than 100 base pairs long. And so the reason we do this is this actually helps to remove a lot of spurious TE annotations that have made it through the quality filtering. Um, this has become less of an issue in the later versions of Repeat Masker. Um, but in older versions, we could get what was classed as a high scoring hit that was eight base pairs long. And I cannot with any confidence tell you that something that's eight base pairs long is a TE or is derived from a TE. So it's safer just to remove these because we, we really can't tell what they are. They're often too short for us to interrogate or to have any identifiable structures. Um, so in general, this doesn't actually remove a huge amount of our annotations because we've gone through the pain of defragmenting and making sure that our consensus sequences are good. Um, but what it does do is just remove those ones that we're not totally confident and sure about. Um, if the user would rather keep these, there are really easy ways to modify this so that these aren't removed. And now we get to the bit where you can look at your Git pod. Um, so that is the whole Earl Grey pipeline from start to finish. And hopefully you will find the results informative, um, particularly the summary plots, which have tried to just make as useful for people as possible. And so if you go to the summary files directory in Gitpod of your run, you should see uh, two PDFs and some other files. So we'll go through the PDFs first, which if you click on them, they should open in a window um, for you to have a look at. So your first thing you should see is a pie chart that looks like this. Um, and essentially what this does is show us the proportion of the genome assembly that has been annotated as TEs from the main superfamily classifications. So it's just a very high level overview, how much of my genome is which TE superfamily. And so in this example, we have a very low TE content because I didn't want you to be here for six hours. Um, and, we're, and also we're just looking at a single chromosome of a species that we know has a low TE content. This graph is the one that I really like. Uh, and I hope you like it too. Um, so on the x-axis, we have a chimera distance. So this is the measure of sequence divergence for each TE copy compared to its consensus. So what we can do is we can use this um, as a proxy for relative TE activity. So more divergent copies were last active longer ago, while recently active copies will have a smaller divergence compared to their consensus. So on this graph, recent activity is towards the right-hand side because we've switched the x-axis into like a chronological order. So ancient activity on the left, and as we move towards the right, we have more recent activity. Um, the y-axis shows the percentage of the genome size that is comprised of TEs with the different activity periods. So in this particular case, we can actually see that ancient TE activity is quite rare. We don't actually have a lot of elements uh, accumulating with high divergence estimates. Whilst we see actually quite a lot of high recent activity, particularly for these DNA Ts with zero divergence, um, which is also quite interesting. Um, as a little side note, this is generally consistent if you're annotating an insect genome, I would hope you find something similar to this graph. So what we see is in insects in general is a high TE turnover with a low accumulation of ancient elements. So ancient elements are purged and there's quite a high turnover of them. However, if you did the same annotation in a mammal, um, I would expect you to find more ancient peaks as well as potentially some recent ones as older elements tend to accumulate in mammal genomes. So if you're just aware of the general patterns in the species groups you're looking at, you can use these graphs to get an idea of whether you found something really weird and cool um, or potentially something wrong. Um, or whether it matches the expectations with the, with other sort of species that people have looked at and uh, had a go with. 
DJ, what is your expectation for plants? Good question. I'm going to admit at this point that I am not a plant biologist and I have not annotated um, many plant genomes at all. If anyone is an expert in plants and would like to mention what they found, I'd be very interested to see whether the patterns are, are different. Um, the question below. So the step for E. coli insertion. Yes, keen eye. Um, this is part of repeat masker. Um, so what it will do is it will look for small things that look like um, it's basically to remove contamination. So if you've got um, contaminated bits in your genome assembly, um, it's just like a hangover from earlier um, annotation. I think it's particularly useful for short read stuff. I'm not sure why it's still in repeat masker, even when you have very long contigs. Um, maybe more of a question for the repeat masker people. Um, but there is a few things that I'm a bit confused about. Um, Annabelle. I've seen chimera distance landscape plots expressed in units of time. I'm not convinced by the clock assumptions that underpin that. Keen to know your opinions. I agree with you. So I will admit that in one paper I've written, I did use a neutral, no, uh, yeah, a neutral divergence estimate to kind of put a time on this. I would prefer. So this is exactly why in this presentation I defined the landscape plot as relative activity within this particular genome because our estimates for te age have huge error bars around them um and it's just not very easy to do just because of the different um kind of dynamics that are affecting te so if we use like a, a neutral divergence estimate um we're going to overestimate the age of some te's underestimate the age of others the main issue we have here is that there's so many different dynamics that are involved in the degradation of a TE. So, you know, if it's under positive selection, it's going to look very, very new. Um, but it might actually just be one part of a TE that's being maintained um, because it's providing some kind of adaptive benefit. Um, equally, if we've got TEs, you know, being degraded through things like ectopic recombination, they're going to look much older than they potentially are, depending on when the recombination event took place. Um, you know, things are uh, being removed by drift selection. There's there's so many different kind of things going on. It's really hard. So I would prefer not to tie an active a uh, kind of clock um, unit of time to it, unless people are willing to acknowledge that these are massively flawed and quite difficult to kind of prove basically um okay sam edta takes in an optional neutral base mutation rate otherwise it's standard for rice for many organisms this number does not exist do you have a number that's being used here no so the chimera distance is just divergence from consensus so we're not trying to put any age or time on it it's just um how similar is it compared to the consensus sequence? Um, again, just for the reason I said, it's it, there's so many weaknesses with trying to estimate the age and activity of a T that I think it's just safer not to bother. Um, but you can use it as an estimate of relative age within that particular genome. Um, or if you're comparing stuff with the same library, you could use it for the same periods there. Um, Hannah, I will answer your question in, at the end, I think, for a second. Uh, DJ, about the pipeline, should you be worried about BC command not found? No. Uh, this is a thing because we're running it in um, Gitpod. It doesn't have that command. It just is to get what time it is because it will just tell you how long it takes. So you can see in this case, it just says done in 0000. zero, 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 zero. So just because that package isn't found on Gitpod. Um, Terry, good question. So yeah, so with this E. coli insertion thing, so th this is again, like a nuance from Repeat Masker. Um, I've had a lot of chats with them about some of the weird things it does. I'm not gonna claim that I totally understand exactly what it's doing, but as far as I can understand from the documentation that they have, it's something to do with looking for old contamination. Um, if you dare to go into their code, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because it's about 10 years of to-do lists. Um, 
you will find some weird stuff where they've tried to explain a few bits. But again, this is one of the problems is that it's never actually been published. So we don't actually have like a paper that explains exactly what it's doing and how it works. Um, it's just become the one thing that everyone uses. Um, so it does do a few weird things. Um, next question. This is the next slide. So I'll go to that now. Here are other useful results that you should find in your summary files. Um, so you should see the following at the end of a successful run. So you'll have an improved TE consensus library. So essentially, what was annotated in my input genome? And this is your dot strained file. It's in standard faster format. Um, this is either going to be a great resource for you to use to annotate other individuals from the same species if you have them. But you could also use this as a starting point for manual curation. So it should, if you use this library, be way less laborious than starting from the unextended families. So you might still have to extend them a tiny bit if you do it by eye, but you shouldn't have to then faff about um, doing it for like five, six rounds and taking nearly a year of your life to do. Next, we have the final TE annotation uh, in GFF3 and bed format. So they contain essentially the same loci. Um, take a moment to explore them if you want, see if you can spot the differences. The main difference is that the GFF has more information in column nine. So specifically, it will tell you the distinct family that was annotated, and this is missing from the bed file. So the bed file will say to you like, um, oh, there's an LTR at this position, whereas the GFF will say there is an LTR and it's round one family seven LTR. Um, so I would recommend using the GFF file um, if possible for your downstream stuff. And finally, we then have two quantification files at different levels. Depending on how interested you are, these are more useful to some people than others. So the high level quantification file will show you the number and coverage of the main TE classifications in your genome. So this is really good if you want a really quick overview um, to compare individuals or species at a very high level. How many DNA TEs are there? How much coverage is there? Does it for each super family? Um, then we have our family level one. Um, so if you want to see which are the most abundant individual families, what their coverage is, this is the one that will help you to see which of those is seems to be contributing most potentially to your genome size, which one's been the most active, uh, things like that. And so, Lana, about extending consensus sequences, are longer sequences always better? Can't we get false positive flanks? Longer does not always equal better. I will say that now. One of the main challenges of automated TE annotation is accurately identifying the boundaries of a TE. And so what we're trying to do here is get as close to these boundaries as we can without overstepping them. And so one of the main reasons that we end up with very long uh, false positive flanks is because we have a T that's inserted into a highly repetitive region or a satellite region. And so that's why we have these extra steps to kind of try and remove these horrible satellite regions from the end. We can get some false positive flanks if we have TEs that are inserted in uh, homologous regions. So where the flanks are basically identical enough that they don't get trimmed, it's relatively rare. Um, and that's why we try to be quite strict with the new consensus covering a certain amount of the old ones and make sure we don't get these weird shifts one end or the other, which would then actually result in your getting longer and longer and longer, but actually moving along as well. Um, so hopefully that helps. We can sometimes get false positive flanks. I mean, it's like I said, we're trying to do the best job we can to automate this for people who aren't specialists. If you're a specialist and really concerned about it, one round of manual curation, if you've got two weeks to spare, would probably help to kind of settle those sort of difficult arguments that are hard to kind of implement with a computational rule. Um, Paula, I'll answer your question again in a sec because that comes up on another slide. Um, Annabelle, thank you for these kiwi fruit examples. Um, this is very cool. So yeah, the, so you you kind of get like one general period of like a nice wave of activity. So you don't get the same sort of patterns as mammals where you get a massive accumulation of old ones, but um, it's quite a cool shape actually. And it's quite nice to see that you get some nice uh, tea activity in your kiwis. Um, so 
you've listened to me talk for a very long time. There were there were two small questions which I think got left behind. Uh, uh yeah. Camille, uh, how good is Earl Grey at annotating non-TE repeats? I don't know if yes. you covered that. Okay. So satellites will get included if uh so if it, if it's a, of a certain length. So repeat masker will also try and annotate satellite repeats with tandem repeat finder. So in your final output, you should see entries for satellites. Um, anything that's in the library, it will annotate. So if you wanted to start with a library of, of non-TE things that you want to find, it will find them. Um, it's also worth noting that we don't remove anything that we can't, that's that's unclassified, as long as it doesn't look like a host, like a host sequence. So we're not shrinking the initial repeat model library too much. What we're trying to do is just improve what the library contains. So some of those might be non-TE um, and they'll be kept. Um, have I missed another one? I think there was one question on assembly quality affecting. Oh, yes. I did leave that one on purpose. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so the last couple of bits. Okay. I want to go through just like where I see the benefits are, what the use cases are, why why are we bother talking about all this, and then that's a perfect time to go through some of these questions that I've got left over. So hopefully um, you've enjoyed kind of getting informed on what the step by step workings of Grey are. I just wanted to wrap up a little bit with talking about why I think it's useful and what some of the ongoing considerations are from within the community and the ongoing conversations that we're having um, on like a larger scale. Um, so by adding all of the processing following repeat modeler, I hope you can see that we've put so much effort into trying to further refine our consensus sequences generated by repeat modeler two. And we're just doing our best to try and get the best consensus sequences that we can, sh importantly, short of a manual curation. So manual curation in my head is still the gold standard and we still want that and still want to use it. Um, but if you don't have time or it's not the main focus of your study, this should get you as close as we can without causing too many problems. Reproducibility, big thing in science. Um, one of the main reasons I built this, by introducing consistent mathematical rules for the formation of a consensus sequence, we remove the variability associated with human intervention. Now, that's not to say that human intervention is not good. You know, it's just that if I go and do a manual annotation of something and then someone who's been working on that specific particular TE for 30 years goes and does it, they might just know that there's this weird, like non-homologous region at this point and include it, whereas I might not include it. And so we could end up with totally different libraries. And so the aim here is that all annotations are treated equally with the hope that we can facilitate comparative studies knowing that you're working on a level playing field with every genome has been treated the same. And so this becomes really difficult. For example, imagine you're working on a species group and for one of them, there's an amazing annotation that someone spent 10 years making. And for all the others, it's absolutely terrible. Like, how can you compare them? You know, you're not comparing the same thing. So we're just trying to level that playing field. Someone can take your data, rerun exactly what you did and hopefully get exactly the same results. Um, in general, we have more complete annotations. So we have less unknown elements, more structural features are recognizable after our defragmentation. And this inevitably is gonna help in your downstream analyses. Um, and finally, this is something that causes me no end of pain in other tools. We want to be able to use the outputs. Um, so the whole pipeline is designed around giving you a file at the end that you can throw into another program without you having to go in and be like, oh, there's a weird space here. There's a comma in this column, all this weird stuff. So all your standard gene annotation pipelines are compatible. GFF3 is widely used in, in you know, across many fields. Bed files are universal. Um, so hopefully you'll find it useful. So you know how it works. How can you use it? So this, I wrote these this morning. So this is no means exhaustive. This is just my kind of off the top of my head recommendations. So first of all, you can replace repeat masker with it. So if you're interested in gene annotation, just use this. It might give you a slightly better library than just using repeat masker for a species that diverged like 10 million years ago. Um, we can use it to quantify and characterize the T landscape in a given genome, exactly what we've done today, um, as well as we can do this in a comparative study. 
So if we've got large numbers of individuals or different species, uh, we the fully automated workflow means you can basically just set all the instances running, press enter, go on vacation, read a book, uh, and come back and it'll be done. Um, as Earl Grey outputs TE consensus sequences as well as final annotations, you can use it to build new TE libraries. So if you have multiple individuals, like I said, a pan genome, a group of very closely related species, again, this serial approach, I think, is a brilliant way. Uh, I can't actually take credit for coming up with it. It was Rob Hubley who uh, came up with it, one of the creators of Repeat Modeler. Um, so rather than running Earl Grey on each assembly at the same time, run it on one, take the resultant library as your starting point for the next one, run it, then take the combined library from that run for your third genome, and so on. And so by using this approach, you have matching annotations across each genome. So family one in genome one is exactly the same family as family one in genome 10. And so you won't have to cluster TE libraries, rename sequences across GFF files um, to get a comparative set. And actually, I highly recommend this approach. Having myself spent a very, very long time clustering 300 plus T consensus libraries without actually thinking about how good this serial annotation would be. Um, and again, it's a head start for manual curation. You might have added a thousand base pairs to each end. Sure, go and manually curate, add another 200 and see what you get. Um, I actually did use it for this for a project that's ongoing at the moment. And I basically only had to manually curate each consensus sequence once before I ended up with a single copy junk DNA at each end. Um, so it saved me a lot more time than just starting from really short ones and having to go through like this whole iterative process. So what are the benefits of this for you guys? So individual libraries for individual species is super important because TE content and diversity is massively different among species. So many species are lineage, well, many TEs are lineage specific. So if we don't take the time to annotate each species, we might actually miss some of these really cool and interesting TEs that will help us to understand the evolution of TEs as well as the hosts. So take this example, three Danaus species, relatively closely related, massive differences in TE uh, content, also massive differences in the families, only a very small percentage of these are actually shared. So there's actually been massive uh, TE activity in like a lineage specific manner. Um, Better TE libraries will also enable more accurate TE prediction. And so this will help to reduce the presence of multi-copy and other host genes in databases, improve the quality of the databases so we can use and trust these. And it will also help to reduce the duplication of effort. If we've got a brilliant TE annotation that's, you know, for loads of different species, we can actually spend more time doing the cool science rather than just re-annotating the same species for the hundredth time because you don't trust the other 99 times it's been done. Um, and it's really important to note, like I know I keep hammering this home, but this is like a big passion for me, um, is that we don't actually have a good grasp on the diversity of TEs across the eukaryotic tree of life at all. Most of what we know has come from model species. Um, and so this is only going to get better if more people are sampling more things. So this is becoming possible through, you know, these amazing efforts that like we have the Earth Biogenome Project, we've got the Tree of Life Project, you know, these are amazing opportunities for us to leverage a huge increase in the amount of genomes, but particularly very high quality ones in which it's easier to find TEs. Um, but importantly here, please don't just go and run these through like a, a quick and dirty program, like take the time to make sure that the TEs we're looking at are genuinely TEs, because, you know, it will just help us to further understand the diversity and evolution of these things. And also, you know, it's amazing to look at the evolutionary impacts these have. Um, and this is a particularly good way to do it. Um, so I'm very excited about where this can go. I'd say we're still in our infancy of, of T annotation, our understanding of it, but I think it's a really cool space to be in. And I'm really happy that so many of you were uh, interested in kind of taking part of that. Um, and I'll just do my last thank yous and then I'll go back to the questions. Um, so with that, you've had a whistle stop tour of Earl Grey. You've listened to me talk for far too long. Um, hopefully your runs on Gitpod have finished so you've got time to kind of go through and play with all the different uh, intermediate results and have a look at what's come out um, and I hope that this has given you the confidence to understand how it, how Earl Grey works and how uh, you can generate T and T your ongoing projects. I just want to thank a few people so uh, Alex who was my PhD supervisor in Exeter who's been there since we conceived the idea of a new pipeline and um, has put up with my endless uh, aims to improve this and probably annoy him to the point where 
Uh, he just wanted some peace and quiet. Uh, thanks to James as well, who was a postdoc in Alex's lab, who helped massively in this um, beat, uh, overhauling this beat process. Uh, he's now in a group in Edinburgh. So if anyone's up there, go and say hello to him. And finally, to my current supervisor in Nishatel, uh, Daniel, who is quite happy for me to keep working away on this and on some other projects. Um, so this is an ongoing thing. I'm still trying to improve it. I think we're on version three now. Um, so there's a lot of things for me to keep going and tinker with and um, go on. And again, I'll go back to the questions now. Um, but if anyone ever wants to discuss any kind of Earl Grey stuff or TE stuff in general, um, then I'm more than happy to do that. So, yeah. <laughs> And I will go back to some of these questions. But thank you, first of all, because that was really <laughs> fabulous. I mean, I, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it, and I think everybody on Discord is loving it. Uh, I see a few applausey hands. That's always good. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Right. So I will go back to. There was a question I missed a while ago from Dorita. The paper of Earl Grey is still a preprint. Um, is it being published soon? I hope so. <laughs> um, yeah, so so basically what it, it went through review um, back when I was writing my thesis um, and I had some brilliant discussions that came out of that. Um, and essentially what happened is I wanted to just go back and spend a bit more time improving it when I actually had the headspace to, to think about it and approach it properly. Um, I have now rerun all the benchmarking as of last Friday. So I just need to sit down and write the paper um so hopefully soon it will be resubmitted there will be an updated preprint when i submit it as well so if anyone's interested in the new benchmarks that's where they'll be um hopefully it won't be too long but it, it's an ongoing work in progress i mean the thing is with a tool you make it you send it and then people highlight issues or things they want added so you just keep improving it so it's really hard for me to get to the point where i freeze it to the point where you know that is the version that i'm going to work with so I'm nearly there, but hopefully, yeah, you can understand that it's it's been an ongoing thing for like five years now. So <laughs> we'll get there, I'm sure. Um, if I go back. OK, Sam, you're referencing EDTA. Could you switch to? Um, is there a similar pan TE annotation strategy? Yeah, so kind of what I alluded to. So this uh I will actually just mention, I'm going, to, I'm going to plug it here as well, because I think it's a little bit of shameless promotion. Any of you that are interested in TEs, there is a, a worldwide Slack channel for people who work on TEs. If you want to join it, feel free to join it. People are happy to talk to you. It's been a brilliant way to talk to people and approach. I felt very confident to approach people on there just to drop them a message. Um, so that's where I kind of ended up having the chat about the serial approach. If you wanted to do a pan genome, that would be the approach I would take. It's on my to-do list to add it as an option. So you can just give it a directory of genomes and it will use such an approach. I just haven't had the time to write it. I mean, like, yeah, it's just now it's just me working on this at the time. And it's kind of like a side project along outside other ones. Um, if there's enough of an appetite for it, I will definitely add it to my very long to-do list. Um, so watch this space. Um Thomas, is it possible to obtain a file similar to a .aln? So if you have a look in the Git pod, in the repeat masker underscore against underscore custom library folder, there will be an align folder in there. I have not worked out how to incorporate the defragmented repeats into that yet. Um, so it is something you can use. I mean, you shouldn't have two dissimilar results from that .aln post defragmentation, really, because they should align to the same consensus anyway. Um, but again, that's something else that's on my to-do list. Um, but for the moment, there is one there if you do want to use it, even if it maybe isn't exactly the same. Um, if you're interested in particular files, um, you could pretend there might potentially be a way around that i've got a feeling it's slightly more complicated than i thought it was which is why it's still on my to-do list but i haven't looked at that for a while um cgi with your re reusing repeat modeler runs um whilst again this is also on my to-do list <laughs> there's not necessarily an official way to do it as long as you have a 
uh, x-families.fa file in the database directory, you can just rerun El Grey with exactly the same commands and it will just skip that step up to that point. So you can just chuck that file in there. Uh, I need to add that to the readme because again, for people, it might be quite useful. Uh, Sam, again, what are some of your goals for the future development of Earl Grey? Okay, I have one feature I'm really excited about um, that we are actually writing, but I've just said I just need to get a paper out there before I add this. Um, this will be released as a separate module if you want to use it outside of Earl Grey. As I kind of mentioned earlier, we have, um, I won't say a major issue because it depends what species you're working on. Um, Multicopy genes has become a bit of an obsession of mine. Um, we don't want multi-copy genes in our databases. It's a problem. We don't want that problem. Um, so we're building a new part of T-Strainer, which will um, look for homology to host genes and remove ones which are very obviously not TEs. This is slightly more nuanced than I thought it would be when I first decided to do it, um, because we have to make sure that we don't necessarily remove TE-derived genes, um, but also we want to make sure that we remove things that are definitely not TE-derived. So I'm still working with James on this one. Um, he's had a little bit of time off since moving to Edinburgh, but it's something we talk about a lot and is coming soon. Um, just wait for a paper first and then I'll have more time to add all this cool stuff. If anyone has any other things they're excited about and want to add, if you go to the GitHub for Earl Grey, feel free to add a discussion, add an issue as a as an enhancement. Um, and I do actually read them, respond to them and add them to my to-do list. Um, my aim is for this to be like a collaborative thing. If people want stuff done, I'm happy to add it. Um, and I think that's a really nice thing to keep like a dialogue going. Um, never be scared to you know have a chat. I'm always happy to talk to people and I think it's one of the best things about science um so yeah super excited to add stuff like that um and just to try and you know incorporate some new stuff that people actually want added um oh some very nice messages thank you everyone <laughs> any more questions yes sam sorry i missed this one so can i speak on the comparison from Earl Grey to edta this is very dependent on what species you're looking at so EDTA, as far as I know, has libraries for rice and then some other plant ones. And if you're working on something else, it has an other flag. Um, in the in the original preprint, it's a little bit out of date now because it's with the old blast extract stem process. I did a benchmark compared to EDTA. Um, one of the main challenges of EDTA on its own is it does not identify um, lines and signs at all. So you need to use it in combination with at least repeat masker, potentially a repeat modeler, um, which I think they might have added maybe. Um, in my benchmarking, I found that it was quite challenged in generating consensus sequences. So it seems to generate thousands of consensus sequences that don't overlap. And I couldn't understand why um, in a simulated genome that only had 30 families in it, it, it made over a thousand. Um, I'm not totally sure why and what's going on, if it's something weird that I've done. Um, but I've just tried to, you know, I, I, I don't want to knock any tools because, you know, for the specific purposes they're built for, they're brilliant and people are using them and we're getting results and it's it's great. Um, I just, in my in my experience, found that some of, some of the classifications were a little bit challenged or a little bit hard to understand how it got to that um, kind of result. But if you check out the preprint, it's in a lot more detail in there. Um, I've just kept it very objective. Just, you know, I, I put what I found. Um, but, you know, we're all trying to improve TE annotation. That's that's the main aim. So, you know, it's great that people are working. We're trying to work with it. I'm not going to claim that my tool's the best or any better than any others. It's probably going to depend on your context and what you want to use it for. Um, and as we know as well, plants are very challenging. Um, they've got tons of TEs, tons of diversity. I'm very glad I don't work on them because it's just very difficult. Um, but I know a lot of people do work on them um, and love looking at the structure and diversity of TEs. So, you know, yeah, check out the preprint and it's all in there. Um, Terry, will the slides be available? I mean, I'm happy to send them to Sujai if, if people want to look at the slides. Is that something you wanted to include? 
Um, I'm happy. To, it, it's up to you. Do you want them on the public facing website or we could just leave it in the discord? That might be nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm happy to do whatever works. I mean, I, I can upload them to the discord after the I session. I can just stick it in the discord. That's probably the yeah. easiest thing. Yeah, no problem. Um, Tell me, tell you, are there ways of classifying TEs as line signs, etc.? Um, yes, so that is done automatically as part of the pipeline. Anything that's still unclassified following that basically means that it didn't have enough homology to a known TE um, or doesn't have any recognizable protein domains to classify it. Does not mean it's not classifiable. It just means in the context of a computer trying to do it, it's not possible. Um, if you have specific ones that you're interested in, I would suggest basically looking for open reading frames and then going on something like um, the CDD database and looking for conserved domains. Um, and if you see what conserved domains that look like they belong to line signs, et cetera, then you've got a pretty good consensus sequence that looks like it belongs to that particular family. Um, so it, with these tools you've used, so like LTR harvest should have identified things as LTRs. Repeat Model 2 should have classified stuff as much as it can. If you're looking at combining tools, um, Signs, there's a really good one called Sign Finder, I think, um, that seems to work pretty well. But again, it depends on the species and how well sampled it has been before. Um, you should also potentially be able to identify lines based on the presence of a satellite tail. But again, they degrade so quickly and you often only have like one active copy that sometimes they can be really hard to find with these tools that look for um, like all by all comparisons. If it's a low copy number, you're just not gonna find it. Um, Hannah, I'm very sorry, I missed your question the first time. So genome assembly quality on how Earl Grey runs. So obviously the dream is telomere to telomere, long read, wonderfully resolved assembly. Is this always possible? No. Um, the hardest parts of a genome to assemble are TEs. Um, I'm doing some projects at the moment where I'm trying to look at TE polymorphism from short reads, and we're lucky if we can get about 70% in a benchmark just because of the nature of short reads and trying to map stuff, um, and it just becomes quite difficult. Um, the best genome you have is good. Um, often it's not necessarily the best way to benchmark, but what we've been doing at the moment is kind of looking at the correlation between and uh, annotated TEs and BUSCO scores. So is there like a threshold that we can set? But you could also look at the correlation between N50 of your assemblies and TE content. And essentially what you, you would hope to see is no correlation if possible. Um, if you do see a correlation, then at what point do you not see a correlation anymore? So, you know, if we say minimum N50 is this, then what, um, you know, then, then basically just being anything below that. Um, Melen Melania, if we have two contig level de novo assemblies, where some contigs might represent the two alleles of the same region, will, will it count them as TEs twice? Um, good question. Where some contigs might represent. If you have a collapsed one, to use to generate your TE library, that would probably be better than trying to annotate uh, a diploid one where you have the same regions present twice. Um, that is an ongoing challenge, particularly for where you're dealing with like polyploidy and things like that. I don't know off the top of my head if anyone has an excellent answer for that. I know it's been acknowledged as a challenge many times, um for library generation i would be tempted to say it's less of a problem because you can you've just got more stuff to sample um but yeah it's definitely well it potentially will have an impact on on how it counts things because essentially what it does well it depends how repeat masker deals with it i would say you know if it's the same region with two different faster header names then it will it, both those regions will definitely be in there um so you might just have to do some post processing in our or with the GFF, just to make sure that if you've got two things labeled that are definitely the same region, you're you know that to remove one or the other. Um, why is Earl Grey called Earl Grey? <laughs> well, so 
the first version was called matcha tea because I liked matcha tea. Um, and essentially we've just gone through and I basically had a tea shelf above my desk. And every time I made a new version, I just went to the next one along. So um, <laughs> essentially, yeah, uh, Earl Grey is just the one we got to and I ran out of tea. So <laughs> that's what we've gone with. <laughs> Hopefully that works. Uh, people like that. Uh, I want to check if I've missed any more questions. Can you use it to benchmark an assembly? Um, as in assembly quality? Yes, that's what I mean. Yes. Yeah, it's a difficult one because we don't have like a... We, we, we don't necessarily know what it should be. Unless, unless you've got lots of very closely related species that have been annotated very well. Um, so I'd be tempted to say no on the point of maybe, but I wouldn't necessarily want to say with high confidence that it definitely could be used to benchmark an assembly unless potentially you know, well, you know, even as we showed that very, you know, it, genomes in the same genus can have totally different TE content so it'd be really difficult i think to know what we would expect um sam you had to go installing but didn't manage to get it working do i recommend a specific approach how did you try and install it if you're there sam was it on like a server or a or a local laptop i've also uh, replied by saying you could follow the conda mamba steps in the git pod yeah, so actually you could use the Git pod, right? If you just wanted to use it for a certain amount of time. Um, but also you can copy the steps in the Git pod and run them somewhere yeah. else. So I would say my go-to, if you just want to install it and use it and your um, institution or place of work has Docker, I would just pull the Docker image. So every time I update Earl Grey, I, I put a new Docker image up. That is configured with uh, the curated section of DFAM. So for classifying elements, we're using stuff that we know what it is. Um, and you can just pull the Docker image and run it interactively. Um, and there is a Docker um, page on the GitHub page for it. So you should be able to just click Docker and it'll have some instructions on how to do that. You don't have to build the container, you just pull it. Um, otherwise, yeah, Sujai's tip is brilliant. Go and look at the Git pod YAML and just go, oh yes, this is easy, I can do this. Um, if you have, I think the only approach that I couldn't get to work was people who weren't allowed to use Docker and Conda. Um, so some places have only got singularity. I have zero experience with that, but if someone is willing to make a version that will work for me, I'd be very grateful. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've tried to give you as many ways as I, as I can feasibly do as one person. Um, but I do understand that not everyone is going to be able to get it working in every situation. Um, if people do play around and get it working, let me know. I'll add it to the to the GitHub. Um, okay, I think I've got a couple of questions at the end. In relation to the genome sequences length or coverage, do you recommend any? Um, a long, I mean, so a long time ago, I did do some benchmarking looking at the effect of N50 on TE content. And I can't remember what we put as the cutoff, but it wasn't as high as I thought it would be. So, I mean, at, to a point, if you want to annotate repeats, just go with the best data that you can have. Um, obviously, it's not the most helpful answer in terms of like an exact number, but it, it will essentially depend on the repeat content of the genome and how complex it is. Um, so it's difficult to give you like one number. Um, okay, thanks, Sam. Yeah, you tried on a cluster with Conda, but it didn't work. Um, try the Gitpod YAML, see if you can get it to work that way. Otherwise, feel free to message me and we'll see if we can work out a way that will get it to work for you. Um, Terry, you should be able to pull the Docker image singularity and it will convert it. I th I did think that was the way to do it. And I think someone did try it and they never got back to me whether they got it to work or not. So I hope that they didn't just disappear off the face of the planet and get fed up. Um, 
but yeah, great. If the Docker image can be put with singularity, then that's that's that problem solved. Um, if I'm correct, all dependencies are available through Bioconda, so it'd be add, possible to add this. It should be. Again, I'll admit, I just haven't had time to look into it yet. Um, I would love it to just be available so that you can just pull it from Conda, Mamba, and just use it. That would be wonderful. Um, so I will make a note to look into that because it is something that's been on my list forever. Um, I think it's just because we've been through so many different versions, I just haven't had time to actually spend enough time on one version to bother doing it yet. Um, this is probably a good time to do it because if we're getting to a frozen version that I'm happy with. Um, I'm the same as Suja. I also just don't know how to write a Bioconda recipe. Um, if there's an easy guide on how to do it, I'd happily spend the time to do it. Um, and I think that's as far as all the questions I've got so far. If anyone else has any others, feel free to unmute and <laughs> ask them. But hopefully this has been really helpful and I'm really happy that all of you showed up to hear about uh, Earl Grey and I hope you've all found it very useful. Definitely very useful. Thank you so, so much. And I know I speak for everybody because I can see how excited everybody is. Um, I'm going to stop the recording, but uh, people should feel free to stay on for a few minutes if they want to say anything. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be here for a few minutes anyway, no problem. I'm 